up till now, we have been pretty abstract about the term model. These two are going to provide two central tools to be able to build a model and then analyze the model. They are Laplace transform, which you should have been exposed to previously, and then Z transform, depending on your level and your previous experience. This may be new or maybe not. Laplace for, time, uh, for continuous time domain systems, and uh, Z transform is for discrete time systems. Now, let's see. Let's do a recap of what we did last time. So we're talking about properties of models. We're saying that uh, good properties in the model will give tremendous benefit in terms of analyzing and controlling it. Linear systems satisfies the superposition property. Okay, linear combination in the input is linear combination, corresponds to linear combination in the output. And then time invariant, uh, we talked about uh, in the long term, cars can be time varying because something's gonna wear out in the system. And then uh, systems that are like the door here, the mechanism, the spring mass damping mechanism here is roughly time invariant because these parameters, they don't change much. We studied the general concept of time invariance and time varying. Now, I would like to go a little bit into details of if we are given the problem about how, how do you mathematically prove a model is time invariant or time varying. All right? Let's take a look at this statement a little bit more carefully. This is saying uh, for time invariance, if we shift the time index for the input, let's say by tau, we shift the time index in the input by tau. We shift the sequence entirely. And then we look at the model output. So model M is called time invariant if corresponding to this delayed or advanced shifted sequence of input, the output M U of T plus tau, the output is exactly shifted by the same amount of time. Right? Let's be a little bit more specific and consider this example. This uh, example that we're going to see again and again in the future. For y dot equal to a y plus b u, these are all indexed with t. What we want to do is to check if you give me an input shift it in time. Let's say I'm going to define it as u tilde. This is essentially u t plus tau. I shifted the time index. So this is, I define, I consider this as a new sequence of input. And then I'm going to check uh, what is the output y, let's say tilde, that corresponds to this shifted, this new input u tilde. It must satisfy, right? It must be that because this is the input output of this model, so it must satisfy y tilde dot equal to a y tilde plus b u tilde t. It must be because this is what the model would give me if you tell me this is the input, this is output. Now, on the other hand, I know that because how this model is, is written, I know that it doesn't matter if what kind of index I use here, right? I can use t or I can use tau. I can use any variable that I want. It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same if I say, let's use, let's say, uh, x as a variable. It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same model same model and if I let x to be equal to t plus tau it's just a change of variable then this should all work out it must be that y dot t plus tau equal to a y t plus tau plus b u t plus tau. This holds just a change of index, change of 
variables in the representation. All right, so look at this one. So this is essentially my U tilde, my newly considered input. From here, we want to test whether this is true. What, what kind of U tilde Y would look like, right? This is what I want to figure out. I want to figure out what is the U tilde corresponding to this input. And then this thing is the fact from just the model description. Comparing these two, I can see that y tilde is exactly y t plus tau. Because it's the same on this side, right? This is the same. And then if you look at compare the notations here, y tilde should be y t plus tau. Let's take a look at another example, and you will see quickly when things go wrong, you will immediately recognize uh, where it went wrong. So let's look at uh, this one. By observation, this is not time invariant because the system property, the system model, the scaling factor in front of you, the input, changes with respect to time. If I look at the system yesterday, is t, let's say, equal to 1, and then today is 24 hours later. The scaling is different. The model parameter is, has changed. What we're going to deal with are mostly time invariant. Uh, mostly differential equations such, a look at, such as this guy here. It contains derivatives in the output, let's say, to the power of n. And then it contains also derivatives in the input, let's say, to the power of m. And then there are a bunch of coefficients that are time independent. So these a and b parameters, they are all constants in, unless we specify differently. This is an ordinary differential equation and uh, specified with the initial conditions. If I need to take derivatives to the power of n, then I need initial condition, initial knowledge about these derivative terms of y. So uh, this is pretty common. Once we know this from the ordinary differential equation class, you can solve this, right? So by calculating the roots of the characteristic equation and then figuring out all the scaling parameters, etc. So there is a procedure to solve this, although sometimes it can get cumbersome. Yeah, we are waiting for support from CDE on that issue, but you did the right thing. Um, just doing that, if that happens again. Okay. All right, cool. Very importantly, for the systems we call them, uh, we need the order of differentiation in the output to be larger than or equal to the order of differentiation on the input. So you can very quickly check, check this. So let's say for the case n equal to, is, this is violated, let's say n equal to zero. I don't have any differentiation in the output, but I have first all the differentiation in the input and see what happens. Then uh, I'm going to have these guys will all go away, and I'm just going to have a zero y equal to first of the derivative b one u dot plus b zero u. All right. So why is this not causal? Because the derivative is here. So that's the case we discussed last time. So derivative, pure derivative is not causal. We cannot really carry this step in practice. So that is the continuous time system. You have differentiation inside. In practice, many applications nowadays, they are digital systems. So you don't have like continuous time sequence every time. So what you have instead is a discrete time sequence. K equal to 1, 2, 3, 5. Okay, this is an index. And uh, uh, the time difference between the index may be small, but uh, it's still discrete. The system then would be described by ordinary difference equation, such as this. 
I have a relationship between the input and output at only these time instances. Then there's no derivative. But instead, I still have, this is still a dynamic system. I'm still using information in the past. You see here, you see here. This system, obviously, yk, looking at this, yk depends on the previous output. If you shift these terms all to the right, you will see yk depends on yk minus 1, yk minus n, etc. This is still a dynamic system, depends on the past of the output. It also depends on the input discrete as well. This is pretty important if you think about, let's say, uh, how your interest increases in the bank. This is entirely discrete time system. You have the annual percentage APR, annual percentage rate, which is defined yearly. You don't do like second percentage rate. It wouldn't make sense. The bank wouldn't do that. Let's, let's take a look at the simplest case. Uh, let's say K is the index for year, year one, year two, and then uh, we are looking at what my uh, money will look like one year after. It's K plus one, and then I will figure out how this bank uh, total amount is going to be dependent on previous dollar amount in my account. The rho is the interest rate. X K is the total amount of dollar at the beginning of this year. And then I deposit a certain amount of money into my bank. So let's say I save all my income and then use it as you put it into the bank. And then you can see uh, for this, under these assumptions, the relationship of your uh, wealth in the bank for the next year is going to be one plus your interest rate times your initial dollar amount at the beginning of the year, and then plus all the money that you put, that you gain this year. So this is just for annual percentage rate. That's how we can do this. Uh, this is the annual interest rate. But in practice, you can imagine many banks, they do this uh, monthly percentage rate. We'll be talking about uh, how we can do this if I have monthly percentage income. So I deposit money in my bank every month, and then the month gets more, so I gain a little bit more interest even in the same year as my deposit becomes larger and larger. But the key point here is that this is a discrete time system. There's no differentiation involved, okay? 